uh, is, is really important as well. From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Thank you, Simon. It's the BBG, not the BBC. You're listening to the Richie Allen Radio Show, live from Salford in Greater Manchester. It's the Richie Allen Show, broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host... Ah, come here. Did you go back to the shops today? Did you go to the shops today in your local town centres? Did you? And all the madness that went along with that today. Yes, the non-essential business is allowed to open in the UK today, providing they could prove they could maintain social distancing and that every five metres there was a hand sanitisation station and masks and visors for the staff and quarantine for the clothes, Jesus, Mary and Holy St. Joseph. Anyway, welcome to Monday's Richie Allen Radio Show. Hope you had a lovely weekend. Dr. Paul Craig Roberts joins the programme in the second hour. A terrific articles, series of articles about recent events in the United States on paulcraigroberts.org, the former US Assistant Treasury Secretary. Before that, though, this hour, I'll be joined by Dr. Marcus De Bruyne, The Marcus was due to be on the programme a few weeks ago. Things were a bit hot for him at that time. Uh, He's a really, really interesting guy. He's a GP based in County Dublin. He very recently quit the country's medical council over the handling of the coronavirus pandemic in care homes. He's been very vocal. I'm really glad that he has. He's uh, stood up and he's spoken out on behalf of his patients. And he joins the programme this hour. Dr. Marcus De Bruyne. That is Monday's. Richie Allen Radio Show. I am the BBG. It's certainly not the BBC. Thanks for joining me, and you can tweet me at any time between now and the end of the programme. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Well, you big baldy gammon, huh? What do you think of what the US Supreme Court Justice has decided? Well, I totally agree with it, of course. It's one of those things that is, an, I believe, an immutable human right. You know, it's, it's true. It should be self-evident. Nobody should be fired by anybody because of their sexual orientation. Absolutely not. Good stuff. Watershed moment, we're being told by the BBC, for LGBT rights in the United States. Yes. Uh, Law, basically law protecting, enshrining in law the rights of gay and transgender employees not to be discriminated against, fired, or or, or whatever, because of um, their sexual orientation. Yes. Absolutely. So I'll say no more on that. What would you expect me to say other than I agree with it? Right. Had a mad afternoon. Really mad. One of those things. I don't scare easily, but you should have seen me in my local football fields this afternoon. I had the dogs in there. I had Jazz, the 12-year-old, Dose, Dose Años. The Stepford dog. Jazz is a Stepford dog, good as gold. And a seven-month-old retriever who's a little bollocks of a dog, uh, daring me to kill her, eating every shit she can find and running away. Yeah. And then out of the blue, just like you'd see in films, the heavens opened up, thunder and lightning, and it pissed down out of the heavens. Honest to God, just like in a movie. And it was instant thunder and lightning. And, well, I wasn't very manly in my response to it. Do you remember... Do you remember a film called The Omen? Do you remember The Omen? Da-da-da. Do you remember Father Brennan, the priest who was on the run from the lightning and the thunder? That was me, one dog under my right arm and trying to grab another dog and running through the field with lightning on my tail. Anyway, a, a genuinely absolute crap your truthers moment. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> and while I was running, the golden retriever who I've got in my arms thinks it's a game and is biting me. <laughs> ah well I got home without getting a bolt through my big baldy head my bonds just about this racism thing boy eh it's getting a bit mad Ted black people of prominence have taken to Twitter to coach us white folks us corn pone country boys and gals <laughs> are you a corn pone guy or gal I'm a bit corn pone I love a bit of Dolly Parton I a bit of Loretta Lynn Bit of Tammy Wynette, bit of Johnny Cash. Honest to God, black people have taken to Twitter to educate me and you. I'm presuming you're white. 
I'm sure, I mean, this is the Salford branch of the KKK over here. <laughs> I'm sure you're white. I have one or two black listeners, I know that. How you doing, Mwinga? So, there's a woman called Dynasty. You couldn't make it up, Dynasty. She's a black woman and she's involved in, in social interaction and she's involved in, 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 not IT. What am I looking for here? What am I looking for? Personnel. And Dynasty is taking it upon herself to write a list of five do's and don'ts for white leaders and colleagues discussing racism at work today. Dynasty. Yeah. Um, We're just going to look at the first one. Number one, be mindful of opening up meetings and interactions with questions like, how are you? Or how was your weekend? Yeah, you see, you'd have thought that saying to anybody you work with, how are you getting on and how did your weekend go? You thought that was fairly okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. Not to a black person because you've got to recognise that by saying how are you or how was your weekend, that you could potentially be re-triggering what your black colleagues are experiencing or dismissing their experience by pretending all is normal. It's not and it hasn't been for a long time. This is genuine. California, this is genuine. Don't say, how are you doing? How was your weekend? Because it's a black person. They must have had a shit weekend. They must have experienced racism. So, so just be very careful. Just be very, very careful, right? There's five or six more of them, but I'm not going to get into them. That's where we're going now. Dynasty. Be very careful now speaking to black people. Laughs everywhere today. It is my job on Monday to use the monologue segment to make you smile, to make you grin, to make you laugh out loud, or to make a little wee-wee in your smalls. Little wee-wee in your smalls or your briefs. There was a rave in Manchester. A rave. 6,000 kids said, enough is e feckin' enough. We want to party. We want to DJ. We want ecstasy tablets. And we want to party like it's 2020. Now, the media is talking about this like it was a capital offence because a man died of a drug overdose, a woman was sexually assaulted, that's shocking, by the way, I'm not virtue signalling, that's not nice, and three people were stabbed during a fight. 6,000 people. That's an average Saturday night on Dean's Gate, right? But the media are acting like it's the worst thing that ever happened. It was in Daisy Nook, Country Park, and Carrington in Greater Manchester. The kids said enough is he feck enough. Police said the, these illegal raves have to stop because they have tragic consequences. Now, Julia Hartley Brewer talked to a guy called Lawrence Buckman. Lawrence spells Lawrence with a U. What an arse, eh? It's L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E. See, Johnny Lawrence of the Cobra Kai. That's how you spell it. Now, he doesn't have a good word to say about the ravers. He's a former General Medical Council guy, doesn't like the ravers, and here he is speaking with Julia Hartley Brewer, Lawrence Buckman. Um, I fear there will be a spike in two to three weeks' time. I think the people that went to the rave are are, are raving. Um, I mean, it's just, you know, <clears throat> enjoy yourself and kill a granny is the answer. Um, and that's what will happen. Uh, young people, they, won't, they probably won't get ill at all, uh, but they'll give it to other people who will. And... I think that was an extreme example of irresponsibility. People who want to demonstrate, I understand why people want to demonstrate for Black Lives Matter. I, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to their, the, the issues that they're, they're talking about. But I just think that there's a point where you crowd together with other people and you are increasing a risk. Outdoors is much safer than indoors. Um, but it isn't safe. It's just safer. And we're talking about relative risk. Yeah. That's your Monday motivation right there. He's giving you the answer to every question ever pondered by humanity. Did you hear that? I, it must be me because I was rolling around the floor this morning laughing at this. Every question you've ever pondered on, everything you couldn't figure out for yourself, you've gotten the answer there from Lawrence Buckman. My wife's cheating on me, Lawrence. What should I do? Enjoy yourself and kill a granny is the answer. That's the answer, right? Right? They want to mandate vaccines for everyone, Larry. Introduce digital health passports and social crediting. What are we to do about it, Larry? Enjoy yourself and kill a granny is the answer. That's the answer. That's the answer right there to every question. That's better than the magic eight ball. 
Love that. Enjoy yourself and kill a granny is the answer. Kill a granny. Anyway, back to racism this morning. Boris Johnson announced a new commission to look into racism because we're all a crowd of insufferable, intolerant, secret KKK meeting, hosting, black people hating, be Jesus, we're terrible. Now we've had millions of these inquiries over the years about racism and they always conclude that there's a few Egypts in every community but the country isn't particularly racist. Boris Johnson speaking to Sky News about the need for yet another inquiry on top of the inquiry, on top of the inquiry. Boris Johnson. The whole point of having a, a review is to look at the, the areas where people feel that uh, there is more that needs to be done. So, for instance, we've, uh, we've already acted on uh, the Lamy uh, report. We did stuff to, and, and, and we will continue to do more to ensure... We did stuff. <laughs> sure that, uh, for instance, uh, young black males involved in crime don't automatically get moved to, uh, to prosecution. You try and sort things out. You, you, you <laughs> make sure that you have more... Uh, BA, black and minority ethnic groups in the prison service, in the probation service, uh, more use of body-worn cameras so you, you know, people have more confidence about the criminal justice system. I think what we want to do is, is learn uh, now very fast what fresh changes we need to, to make. And I just what I feel most strongly is that there are so many positive stories that are so far that are not being heard. And things really are changing. And you're seeing uh, you know, young, young black kids now doing better in some of the most difficult subjects in school uh, than, than they were ever before. You're seeing more going to top universities. We need to start telling that story uh, and building up a culture of high expectations, of a narrative about success as well as stamping out the the racism and the, and the discrimination that unquestionably exists. So it's it's two things I think we need to do at once. Yeah, fair enough. I'd be asking, to be honest with you, it's just me, I'd be asking, I'd be asking, and I'd be asking every single time this question ever came up, I'd be asking Lawrence Buckman, Lawrence, what are we going to do about the racism? Enjoy yourself and kill a granny is the answer. That's it, just enjoy yourself, kill a granny. Don't worry about racism at the end of the day, it's ridiculous, right? Now, Marcus Rashford is a centre-forward. Very old-fashioned thing to say. And a fine centre-forward is he. He plays for Manchester United. Get in. And um, he's been calling on the government to reverse the decision not to provide free school meal vouchers during the summer. And Marcus has been telling the BBC the system isn't built for families like his to succeed. He's a very successful footballer. He grew up in Withenshaw. He's very highly regarded there. Seems to be a good lad. I know a few, uh, well, I know quite a few sports journalists who've met the guy over the last few years, and they say he's a good lad. And it's a good campaign. And he means it. And fair play to him, right? Basically, the government has said that we're not extending the food voucher scheme into the summer holidays, and that is that. And Marcus has been saying... Families that are living on subsi on, in a subsistence manner, this really hurts them. So I'm campaigning. And he's also managed to raise about 20 million quid for, for people um, who, who are struggling to put food on the table during the whole pandemic hoax. So he seems to be a good lad. Right? There's no need to virtue signal. Seems to be a good bloke. Right. So fair play to Marcus Rashford. Now, LBC Radio's James O'Brien, on the other hand, couldn't resist the opportunity to engage in a bit of virtue signalling around Marcus Rashford. I mean, it's an open goal, right? Isn't it? Here's James O'Brien. This is beautiful. The curious process that has seen the United Kingdom become a country where the Prime Minister chooses today to speak up in favour of statues of dead white supremacists, while the footballer Marcus Rashford is speaking up in support of 1.3 million hungry British children of every creed and colour. I think I'll say that again, actually. Um... What's the date? This is quite an important... He thinks he's profound, O'Brien. O'Brien is a finance guy from the London School of Economics. I would say James O'Brien is the worst radio presenter ever to sit behind a microphone. He is wretchedly poor, right? But he thinks he's amazing. And that's what makes him really funny. He thinks what he's about to say is profound. On the one hand, Marcus is out there demanding free school meals for the poorest. 
while Johnson is defending white supremacist statues. Listen to this bullshit. Quite an important day, I suspect, for historians of the future. And um, if I do nothing else at work today, hopefully I'll get a footnote in a history book of the future. On Monday the 15th of June 2020, the British Prime Minister elected to write an article behind a paywall in a newspaper owned by billionaires about the importance of protecting statues of dead white supremacists. Meanwhile, Marcus Rashford, a young footballer... He really believes that this is an important moment now, James O'Brien, in his career. ...who has already raised and donated millions of pounds to poor children's families and poor children's charities. Marcus Rashford elected to call upon the government <laughs> to extend free school meals through the, through the summer holidays for about 1.3 million children, British children, of every creed and colour. That to me, and I, I, I usually get this wrong, I've got to be honest with you, my faith in human nature is a, is a cross that I bear. That to me is huge. That's a pivotal moment. It's Somebody has to live with this arsehole. God love her or him, because I don't know. Moment in, in social history. Prime Minister speaking up for statues of dead oh. racists. Footballer speaking up for 1.3 million hungry British school children. Yes, but if you were listening carefully to that diatribe of absolute tripe horseman, you're right, you would have caught the bit in the middle where O'Brien basically gives himself away. This little, this mini rant about the Prime Minister is not about Marcus Rashford's goodness or about his benevolence. It's all about James O'Brien. Listen to this. This is quite an important day, I suspect, for historians of the future. And... Um, if I do nothing else at work today, hopefully I'll get a footnote in a history book of the future. You'll get a footnote. This is quite an important day, I suspect, for historians of the what? future. And um, if I do nothing else at work today, hopefully I'll get a footnote in a history book of the future. <laughs> so it's not about Marcus Rashford then. It's about you drawing attention to it and getting a footnote in the history books of the future, Jesus. What kind of fuckery is it's pretty bad fuckery, you know. What do you do about guys like James O'Brien, eh? Enjoy yourself and kill a granny is the answer. Yeah, I should just stop worrying about James O'Brien and enjoy myself and kill a granny. Hi to Laurie. How you doing, Laurie? Who says, Richie, I live in corn pone country. Get in there, lass. Does this mean I can't address individuals as y'all anymore? Hate to disappoint, but this country gal will say y'all till she drops. Get in there. You get in there, girl. Absolutely right. Hi to Rose Leeming. How you doing, Rose? And uh, I've got to give a big shout out to Kieran Leeming. How you doing, Kieran? Nice to know you're on board uh, this afternoon. Rose, thanks for the tweet there. I'll check it out a little bit later on. It's a meme, is it? It's a meme. Oh, no, it's a message from your dad on the Isle of Man. How you doing, Kieran? Thanks for tuning in to the BBG today. I really appreciate that. Hi to David Stewart Cole, by the way. Hi to Faisal. How you doing, Faisal? That um, little soundbite is perfect for a ringtone, says Faisal. Absolutely right. Hi to Charlie. Hi to Patrick. And hi to Gail. Let's move on up to... Hi to Elizabeth Ita. How you doing, Elizabeth? Now, Elizabeth is a black lady. And I know Elizabeth has been listening to the programme for some time. Richie, we're all being distracted, in my opinion. I couldn't care less if someone asks me how my day or weekend was or about Boris's racist inquiry. Laugh out loud, she says. I'd be more interested in an inquiry into who runs the secret Westminster pedo sex ring and throwing them behind bars. Thanks, Elizabeth, for your comment this afternoon. 22 minutes past the hour. Don't forget Dr. Paul Craig Roberts joins me in the second hour. He's been following what's been happening in Atlanta in the last uh, uh, 36, 72 hours. He's been following it uh, the George Floyd um, um, uh, killing or murder and what's happened about, you know, since then. Lots to talk about with Paul. But before that, in a couple of minutes, Dr. Marcus De Bruin joins me from Dublin, from Bolia Ohaclea. He's a, a top guy, I believe. I tried to get him on the programme a few weeks ago, but there was um, he was getting a lot of heat at the time. He was the focus of the... The well, well, he was getting a lot of coverage in the mainstream media in Ireland, getting a lot of stick and a lot of flack. But but he's he's agreed to come on. He's been tweeting out some very interesting things. Former HSE member, former government advisor, effectively, and he gave up that position because of his, well, I suppose his, his I won't say disagreement with, but yes, his criticism of how the Irish government has handled the alleged pandemic. 
So we'll have him on in a couple of minutes' time. Welcome to Monday's Richie Allen Radio Show. It's always brilliant to be with you. How you doing? Right, that is uh, music from Martha Reeves and the Vandellas on the Richie Allen Radio Show. 25 and a half minutes past the hour. Welcome to the programme if you're just joining us. This is really important. Let me briefly read from the Irish Sun today. A GP who quit the medical council over the handling of the pandemic in the care homes has blasted the upcoming lifting of the ban on visitors. Nursing homes are expected to reopen to visitors from today, having been closed to the public since mid-March in a bid to prevent the deadly virus spreading. Dr Marcus de Bruyne, a GP based in Russia in Dublin, has slammed the move saying COVID-19 is still in the nursing homes. It's still in the community. Now the doors are going to be open and people are going to start going in and out. As a result, there is a very serious chance that we are going to see a resurgence of it in the nursing home sector once they are pushed into this situation. And uh, Dr De Bruyne went on to tell the son about how one of his patients was sent home from a nursing was sent from a nursing home even to hospital last weekend diagnosed with COVID-19 and died. And Dr Marcus De Bruyne joins us live on the program today. Marcus, thanks so much for taking the call. How are you? I'm not so bad, Richie. I'm not so bad. How are you getting on yourself? I'm really well, thanks. And, and, and I'm so glad we, we, finally, we, we finally connected. Can we start with the nursing homes? Because yeah. one of the things I was told by an English GP who isn't practising anymore, uh, Vernon Coleman, somebody I'm sure you are familiar with, one of the things that he was very concerned with was back in February, March, people were being sent from hospitals to free up hospital beds, senior citizens who did have the virus or were showing symptoms and they were sent into care homes. And he described that as, in his words as basically murder. And that's, you know, we're seeing some discussion of that on Sky and the BBC in recent days. Is, is that, does, does that make sense to you in terms of the Irish picture? Did that sort of thing oh. happen in Ireland? Look, it certainly did happen in Ireland, and that's that's essentially. I mean, I I I I'd be in complete agreement with the suggestion that how it was primarily introduced um, into, or at least one of the mechanisms that it was most definitely introduced into the nursing homes was through this kind of panic policy of dumping um, patients from the hospitals into nursing homes that had capacity or empty beds. Um, in dumping those patients into the nursing homes without prop, without following any sort of you know testing criteria from them. I mean, we were we the policy here was essentially symptomatic asymptomatic patients were transferred into the nursing homes without tests, and we were told, well, look, if they've symptoms or developed symptoms, just you know isolate them for uh, isolate them for two, for two weeks. But that 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 was a, a policy, you know. There was you know, and it, it wasn't just that policy. That might have been the policy that introduced it, you know. But there was lots of there was of other policies. I mean, a very strange, the, the most bizarre and probably most horrific policy in Ireland was from, you know, the, the 21st of March, all the nursing home doctors were issued a, 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 a statement from the, or a guideline from, from the government telling us not to test any nursing home residents if you have one case of COVID in the nursing home. And that, so during the very height of the crisis, when, when it was kind of, when people were really dying and the, the, where things were really kind of falling to pieces you know we weren't allowed to test nursing home residents if you had one case in the nursing home so for, from Irish doctors from our perspective and our point of view is is that when you're working in a nursing home trying to diagnose COVID in elderly people people many of them who have underlying conditions some of them are on nebulizers or inhalers and things trying to make a diagnosis in the nursing home setting is difficult anyway of risk of any kind of illness but the, they're the people who needed to we needed to test to be able to isolate to be able to diagnose to put do not resuscitate status in place to contact family to organize PPE to you know you know, isolate staff, isolate residents. But in this bizarre move, you know, the government pulled the testing from the, the, the very people that need it, not just at my home, but at all nursing homes around Ireland. And that stayed in place for three weeks flat. So for three weeks, I'm, go, I'm going to the nursing home and I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing patients and I'm putting them on the list, trying to make a diagnosis, trying to get a test. And then I'm going back to my surgery 
you know, where people are ringing up and they've got a snotty nose or they're kind of out doing their shopping and they're worried about a test. And according to the criteria and guidelines, if a member of the public has a runny nose or has a temperature or has any suspicion at all, test, test, test. So I'm going to the nursing home and the people who I need to get tested to make a clinical diagnosis to try and help save their lives or help their families and help the nursing home staff, they're booted off. Now, they were actually booted off the testing request list. And then I'm going back to the surgery, to my surgery where I work, and I'm, I'm fielding calls from, from the worried well, all of whom I'm putting on the list for tests. So I'm in this completely surreal sort of a reality where the people who I need to test and make the diagnosis for, I can't. And I'm going back to my, my surgery and the people who don't need testing and there's nothing bloody wrong with them, I'm booking them for tests. So, you know, we're, we're, we're in a state in Ireland now where people are scratching their heads wondering, oh, how have, have we ended up with over 1,000 people dead in nursing homes and we're the same as Canada or, or even maybe worse, you know. We're like the worst in the world on the planet beside Canada for deaths in nursing homes. And the real tragedy is... Nobody seems to give a shit. And has anybody, Only Marcus, did. has anybody given you an explanation to date as to why the decision not to test the residents of those homes was made? No. Why? No, no. The answer is, is we were doing our best and these were kind of WHO guidelines and it happened in some other places. Now, they never tell me where the other places are, but it happened elsewhere and, you know, it just took everybody by surprise. All the usual political palaver bullshit that you get, you know, you, you, that's what you get back. But, the, you know, the, the real tragedy here is, is that, you know, people like myself, when you you stand up and you state the facts because I'm not making any of this up and it didn't just happen to me if this was a national policy you know when you stand up and you say these things you're kind of branded as some sort of conspiracy theorist some lunatic or, yeah. or something like that I mean there's a real you know I mean you're you're Irish you know yourself the way things tend to work in Ireland we've yeah. just got we, we only just got ourselves out from under the yoke of in many respects of a, of a dysfunctional Catholic church but we're still well under the yoke of RTE and of the media and of kind of toe the line and do what you're told. A conspiracy, you know? of, a conspiracy of silence. I, I wouldn't dare to put words in, in your mouth. I'm going to ask you again, I mentioned my interview with Vernon Coleman. I, I think my, yeah. my, my listeners, because I've mentioned it so much, we have had other GPs on from other parts of the world, but I mentioned Vernon so much people think I'm enamoured of the man. I'm not, but he said something very interesting. And I know that some people think he's very eccentric. Vernon said that he's concluded that, and a number of my listeners have said this to me today, that the elderly are seen as expendable. Now, in fact, he actually went further and he said that if he, you know, if he didn't know any better, he would see it as a kind of an extermination policy. And I've just had a message from a great friend of mine who's Irish, who helps out with the research for this program. And she said that there appears to be a real coldness about the HSE and indifference towards old people. Is there any truth yeah. to that, Marcus? Are old people expendable? Is that what it is? Well, you know, I think are old people expendable to the people listening to your show and to the people I talk to out on the street? They're not. Of course they're not. They're our grannies. <laughs> they're our yeah. granddads. They're people we love, people we care about. But in terms of kind of democratic politics, I think, unfortunately, this is a situation where politics and medicine, and I'm not a politician, I'm not a member of a party, but politics and medicine are in bed together now until this plays itself out. This is a very political, medical thing. But in terms of kind of the politics of it, old people are expendable in terms of politics because old people are not consumers. They're not, by and large, voters. They don't command a big sector of the voting, a political influence. They don't have a huge amount of political clout or advocacy. So when kind of COVID-19 arrived, there was a big scramble for politicians, I think, to be seen to do the best thing and be seen to look after the most people. And so it, it, in, in, a, in a political sense, in a democratic sense, I think they are expendable because they really don't count. I mean, we had our Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, who, who is a doctor, you know, and he, in the midst of this crisis, he rejoins the medical register, puts on a hasman suit and kind of runs to answer the phones and do swabs on traveler halting sites. And it was all a big PR stunt for about two weeks. This guy's answering the phones and everything. And it did wonders. I mean, people loved it. They lapped it up like warm milk. They were absolutely addicted to it. 
But whilst that shit was going on, you know, the real people who needed to be cared for, they were, they were getting treated like animals. They weren't even getting the basic same treatment. I mean, if they were getting the same treatment as everybody else, you could say, oh, De Bruyne's a lunatic. They were treated the same. But they weren't even getting the same. They were getting an in, inhuman level of treatment. So in a political sense, it thinks in terms of democracy, in terms of politics, in terms of kind of winning votes and that, yeah, old people are in, in expendable. I, don't, I, I wouldn't agree that, you know, there was a group of people sitting sitting in a, in a back room in, in government buildings and they said, here's a great chance to get rid of all the old people. I think yeah. that they just didn't give a shit about it because old people, as they say, they're not consumers, they're not voters, they don't matter. And this COVID thing, one of the positive things about COVID, I suppose, is, is that it's exposed a lot of the truths of politics and the truths of the, how the country is run and what people get. You know, I mean, Irish people at the minute, we're in the middle of a big bribe fest over here. I mean, we got 300, the, the dole payment, unemployment payment was almost doubled for people. You know, nobody's going to work and people are getting loads of money. And, you know, there's a massive big, the COVID for the government was a massive big PR job, you know, in terms of kind of winning votes, being seen to do the right thing. But actually, well, it has to be paid back, Marcus. Or medicine? No, it didn't. It wasn't on the table. It know. wasn't on. Doctor Marcus De Bruin is our guest. But the, the sad thing about the furlough schemes and the payments is this will eventually have to be paid back. And I imagine, as somebody who used to do financial journalism, the austerity to come in the near future is going to be unbearable, and that's going to have a huge impact on people's health. <laughs> I don't know if you're watching. If you're, you, I'm sure you are watching the Irish media. What's yeah. playing out here? There's a there's a comedy, and I suppose it's probably the wrong term to use, given that we're talking about so many people have died. But in the political sense, there's a comedy playing out in Ireland. I mean, the same people in Ireland, Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, the, the same politicians who were responsible for these for the catastrophe for, if you want to say, the whole-scale euthanasia of a thousand people in the nursing homes. The same people responsible for that. They, they're not an elected government at the moment. We had an election and they should have been gone a long time ago. So we have a kind of, we have a government, they're hanging in, uh, they're in there at the minute just by default. Yeah. They have to, they, they have, we have to form a new government. So in order to form a new government, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael are in negotiations with the Greens, right? And, and Eamon Ryan is the leader of the Greens, and they're desperately trying to get, if they can get him on board, then it's the same old, same old. The same people who were responsible for all of these guidelines, they're the people, because there will be a public inquiry, but the people who are going to frame the, it's very important for Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael to get back in power so that they can frame the whole set up of the public because there will be a public inquiry so in terms of its terms of reference who's yeah. going to show up what its powers are all of that it's absolutely crucial for Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael to remain in power and they're bringing Eamon Ryan once they're, they're trying to they're promising him everything to do it but the point I'm getting to is is that the irony of it all as you say this is going to have to be paid back and how it's going to be paid back in my and this is only my opinion is green taxes we're going to get carbon taxes we're going to get absolutely. all of these things so the man who's been bribed in is going to turn out to be the ultimate scapegoat for the best part of the taxes that have to pay for it. So the re that's the real, I think, ultimate irony of it, that they'll stay in power, they'll get the Greens in to sign the ticket and keep them in power, and when the going gets tough and the taxes have to come in, they're all going to be green taxes, carbon taxes, environmental taxes, and they'll stand back and they'll say, well, that's the Greens' fault, that's not our fault. So it's a it's a win-win situation, and, and that's what's kind of a bittersweet thing thing for me and a bittersweet thing for many Irish people. It's a win-win situation for the people who are responsible for the neglect of so many victims. And it was ever those. Home. I must ask you this, <laughs> but what, what, because uh, you're going to stay with me till, till just before the top of the hour. I'm delighted yeah. you're on. Dr. Marcus De Bruin is a respected uh, GP working in, uh, in Rush in, in County Dublin. And he's been, he, he's made national headlines in, in recent weeks, um, leaving the HSE, leaving the council and, and making a stance, a courageous stance in my opinion. I shouldn't editorialise, but I'm going to do it anyway. I think it's a courageous thing to do when you're doing it on, on behalf of patients. One of the things that kind of triggered me onto you early on was, was the need for the lockdown. You don't believe that there was any need to, you know, basically close down the economy and tell healthy people that they had to stay indoors. Have I got that right, Marcus? 
Oh, absolutely. Look, sure, sure. I mean, I don't know. It's a little bit like, I remember a friend of mine told me, a, a, a priest friend of mine told me a story that, you know, he had to bring, he's an Indian guy in, in southern India, he's a Catholic priest, and he had to bring a, 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 one of his parishioners to see a psychiatrist, you know. And he, and this is a true story. He says he brought so he, he, he himself and he brought the, the parishioner, you know, who had completely gone nuts. Brought him into the to the hospital, into the psychiatrist, and the priest and the psychiatrist were, were, were or the priest and the and the and the, the the crazy guy, if you want, were sitting on the side on on one side of the desk. And the, you know, the psychiatrist says, "Well, you know, what can I do for you?" You know, and 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 the the crazy guy pipes up and he says, "Well, I'm here with this fella who thinks that he's a parish priest," you know. And the psychi- and the parish priest kind of has to pipe in and says, "No, no, no! I, I, I am a parish priest. I'm bringing this guy who's in, who's crazy." So. The, the, the psychiatrist on the other side of the table was kind of, for a while, scratching his head, saying, well, what the hell am I going to believe here, you know? I think that's the kind of crazy situation that we're in at the moment. Nobody really knows what to believe. You know, there's so many scientists telling you lockdown is great, lockdown was right, and there's so many scientists saying it's complete bullshit. Nobody really knows what to believe. So if you want to be objective about things, you really have to look at a country that doesn't have lockdown, and that's essentially that's that's Sweden but again you know there's a huge amount of PR spin about what's going on in Sweden you know I, I was on the computer the other night and I, I, I did the kind of calculations for Sweden you know the thing about the Sweden thing is is and people are probably brown pain in their arse listening to, to, to Sweden but the thing that people that the media and people aren't focusing on is is if you if we ask ourselves who does COVID-19 kill who does the virus who dies from it it's over 65 year olds that's who it kills 90% and that's not conspiracy tinfoil hat shit that's a fact 90 over 90% of the deaths are in over 65 year olds so if you look at the population of Sweden and you ask okay how many over 65 year olds there are in Sweden and this you'll get this on the internet it's black and white it's any demographic website will tell you you know there's 2 million over 65 year olds in Sweden and then if uh, you can only compare it to I, I compare it to Ireland so if you look at Ireland you say well how many over 65 year olds have we got in Ireland we've got 670,000 okay so you're talking roughly three times the number of over 65 year olds in Sweden that we have in Ireland but you know they've got twice the number of you you know, of, of debt. So, you know, when you look at the facts, Sweden is there with no lockdown, and it's actually, I did the calculations on the computer the other night, if you calculate debts per 100,000 over 65-year-olds, I don't have the figures in front of me, but Sweden comes in at about 260 or 252 or something, and Ireland comes in below that, Do you know, or, or sorry, higher than that. Higher, we've got yeah. a higher, we've got a higher death rate in the over 65s than Sweden and, 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 and they've no lockdown. And, you know, the main point here is, is that that's where the mortality is. So I see a lot of UK studies, a lot of people coming out and they're using this per capita. They're saying per capita and Sweden's death rate per capita, but nobody's really looking at the actual demographics. I mean, the UK has got about 20 times the death toll that the Irish have. And hey, presto, UK has got 20 times the population of over 65. More. Yeah, yeah. So demographics doesn't people who die that, that you can't lie about that when they die. Maybe there's a bit of tweaking going on with death certs and things, but you can't lie about a death. Someone's either dead or they're not. That's fairly black and white. And you can't deny the fact that it's over sixty five year olds who die from COVID. So if you look at the facts that way, then Sweden is doing much better than Ireland, much better than the UK, and they've they've no lockdown. And they've so no lockdown. The, and they've no lockdown. So, you know, mm. but there's a, but, you know, at the end of the day, there's a huge, a huge amount to play for here. If it emerges that lockdown is wrong or the nursing homes were neglected, there's very, very big, powerful people, very big, powerful organizations that are going to have to answer some serious questions. And at the minute, Ireland, I don't know if you've been back here for, for a while, but Ireland is like, it's, it's, it's like the zombie apocalypse. And I don't mean that anybody walking around is like COVID and going to die from COVID, but the vast majority of the Irish people are walking around like zombies, completely tied in and locked into all of this bullshit about why wearing though? masks why and Marcus, about why? driving their cars with masks on and following yeah. these ridiculous, ridiculous public health guidelines but they're all hearkening back to you know, reinforcing you know, the guidelines that came out at the very start because if there's any hint of revision 
if you have to revise, that means something might have been done wrong. So there's a real, real pressure not to revise, not to change, not to kind of change tack. We're going to play this out. And unfortunately, the general public are kind of on board with all the, the, the bullshit because we've got a national media over here, RTE, and it's absolutely no different to the to the, to the what the Catholic Church was mm. 50 years ago, you know? People and are the BBC, completely bought into it. Well, what you've described there in terms of people's behaviour is pretty much what we've seen in England. I, I can only yeah. speak for, for the North West. People have been behaving in the very same way. We could speculate... I mean, I think the media, I think you're right to mention RTE and the BBC has been the same here. You know, the, the professors you mentioned whom were very scathing in their criticism of the lockdown, they've been marginalised. I mean, you've, yeah. you've come in for a lot of personal criticism because you dared say, as a learned man who's earned the right to say it, well, my opinion is we didn't need to... Uh, to do a lockdown. Were you surprised by that, Marcus? I mean, I, I, I've, I've tried to learn as much as I could about you before our conversation today, but I could only get, you know, basically mainstream media uh, stuff. So I don't know how how much you might have expected to be targeted in the way that you were. Was, did that come as a surprise to you? It, it doesn't come as a surprise to me because kind of something, you know, something that I've kind of felt for a while that there's a lot of vested interests in Ireland. And, you know, I mean, I'm a GP. I make a lot of money. I'd probably make too much money, in fairness. I wouldn't mind making a little bit less if I thought the taxes were going into a bit of social investment. But, you know, GPs, we, we, we make a good living, you know. There's, there's no two ways about it. And when you rock the boat and you start to kind of question the health service, well, you know, I mean, newsflash, GPs, we are a big part of that health service you know but the, there's the, there's a there's a serious connection in in general practice in gps in ireland like all most gps in ireland would be members of the irish college of general practitioners that's our like the english you have the the the, the uk college of general practitioners and you have the irish college of general practitioners and the irish college of general practitioners that's the body that kind of you know issues guidelines for gps and if you're in the icgp and you're a member of the college well you can get lots and lots of benefits like you can get a trainee GP come out to your practice and the government pays his, his or her wages and they'll work at your surgery. You get to keep the private money they generate. You don't have to pay them a cent and you can take a holiday or get a day off or whatever. You know, these are some of the benefits if you're in this, if you're in the college. Now, the Irish College of General Practitioners, well, they've got two members on NPET, on the government um, advisory, the people who are issuing the government with all the lockdown restrictions. So there's a very deeply vested relationship between the Irish between GPs, the Irish College of General Practitioners, the Irish College of General Practitioners connected to NPET, NPET connected to government, connected to the lockdown. So it's all really, really tight. So the minute you kind of start to ask questions are rock the boat a lot of people with a lot of power in very powerful positions certainly start to feel threatened and vulnerable and get angry at you so yeah i mean i to be honest i suppose i was a little bit the thing i'm surprised about to, to be straight is is the fact that that there's so few of us there's about three or four gps in ireland who are like saying pointing to the reality not the makey uppy tinfoil hat shit but pointing it to the reality that people died in nursing homes as a consequence of pol serious political and, and governmental and, and professional neglect. That's what we're kind of pointing to. But my surprise is, is that there's so very, very few of us. I didn't think it was as bad. I didn't think the kind of the, the, the whole kind of stay within the club and kind of who cares about the old people, we've got to look after ourselves. I didn't think it was as bad as what it is appearing to be. But I don't give a shit, really, if they want to kind of call me a, a conspiracist or a tinfoil hat wearer or anything, you know, fact them. You've got them. Um... <laughs> you know, I, I'm 50 years old. I've about 20, 30 years of living left. So I'm going to stick by what, what, what I see as the facts. Unless somebody comes... I mean, I'd love someone to come back and say to me, Marcus, listen, the Sweden... You you're looking at that's a different Sweden it's got a different spelling it's in a different you're, you're completely off the ball. I'd love someone just to come back to me and say Marcus listen you are a bit crazy because there's another Sweden that you're missing out on yeah, or that yeah. the old people those letters you got from the HSE they were typos and they were sent to you by mistake 
But none of that's happening. I mean, the facts are the facts. But the surprising thing is, is yeah, you, you feel on your own. You feel like a bloody lunatic, you know. But what can you do? You shouldn't, though. I mean, the support you've received on social media is is enormous. Dr. Marcus De Bruyne is our is our guest. Like I said, he's a, a very well thought of GP in Rush in County Dublin. A lot of people who know you have been in touch with me, asked me not to mention their names. But said, I'm glad you're, you've had Marcus on, Richie. I, I mean this, I've got the emails to prove it. He's my doctor. He's a great guy. Plenty of time. He spends lots of time with his patients. And, um, you know, we, we, we believe in him. So, so Marcus has uh, been very critical of the need for the lockdown. And he's also spoken up for, for, for residents of nursing homes in Ireland. And he's criticised the government. I want to talk about this before we run out of time. Um, a lot of things are said in the media about this particular radio programme. I'm not a doctor. I know nothing about medicine. And I am not anti-vaccine. I'm not. I don't know anything about them. Um, but, but I do believe over, over time, I do believe that some vaccines, because there was maybe a cavalier approach to safety, some vaccines were maybe harmful. I think we've got the evidence to, to suggest that is the case. And I do believe the girls and their mothers of regret in Ireland who are worried about Gardasil, but I'm not even going to ask you about that at all. Yeah. You're not remotely anti-vaccine. And you um, suggested that it mightn't be the best thing to do if there is a COVID vaccine. It might not be a good thing to do to give it to young people and healthy people because it's unnecessary. And my God, the ad hominem attacks began again. Personal attacks on you. That's outrageous. I mean, again, I'm not anti-vax. This is not an anti-vax. I have had anti-vaxxer people on, of course, and I've challenged them. And some of them have yeah. been GPs like yourself. I, I do my job yeah. and I challenge. But but holy God, like, I mean, what you're saying makes some sort of sense to me. And you've had people who know nothing about medicine, you know, people who have positions in physics in other parts of the world, coming after you and swearing at you. What's going on, yeah. Marcus? What's going on? Well, well you know, I mean, again, it's, 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 it, I suppose the only example, I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not an antichrist or anything, but the only example I can come off the top of my head is kind of like the, the, the power of the institution and the church and kind of, you know, the power of kind of, you look at the Nuremberg rallies and, you know, people say Hitler was a bad man and unquestionably he was. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to contradict yeah, that, yeah. you know, but, but when you look at, it, it's not, it wasn't just him and wasn't just the Nazis, it was the people who were at the bloody rallies, the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people who bought into this ridiculous, brainwashed, anti-human, you know, rhetoric of burning people and, and doing horrible things. You know, I think we're in we're in the same place again, where we're, we're in this bizarre sort of a reality where so many people have bought into a rhetoric that if you challenge it in any way, you know, I think it, it, it's, it's, it's a dangerous place to be at the moment. But history is not going to be kind to this. I mean, history is going to look back. I mean, you, you, when you talk about vaccines, like I vaccinate kids, I vaccinate my own kids, I vaccinate kids every day. I, you know, I, I'm not a vaccine expert. I don't know. All of this vaccine stuff has caused me to look at vaccines a bit more closely, but I haven't been turned against vaccines. But if you take the issue of vaccines, I mean, I vaccinate kids. Let's take two conditions that I vaccinate kids for. One is rotavirus. That's a vaccine, an oral vaccine. The kids get to, infants get two doses of it. Now, I've been, we've been given that in Ireland for the past couple of years. Meningitis B, we give that. You, you take meningitis and you take rotavirus. These two things that I vaccinate children for, right? You can get rotavirus tomorrow. It'll give you diarrhea. It'll give you a case of the trots. You'll be running in and out of the jacks. You'll be like you had maybe 20 pints of beer and you'll feel shit for a day or two, but it won't kill you. But if, if rotavirus hits a, 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 an infant, now chances are the infant will be fine, but it's much more risky in that population. So hence, the medical logic, the common sense logic is you vaccinate infants against rotavirus. Now, I do that because that's what I'm told to do. And, it, and on the surface, it makes sense. The same with meningitis. You know, you can get the meningitis bug just like I can, but chances are it's not going to do any harm to you. So we don't vaccinate adults and young, healthy people. We vaccinate the kids with those diseases. Now, flip that over to COVID. And if you say, well, okay, we have a disease here that over 90% of the deaths are in over 65, people with underlying conditions, that's who dies from COVID. We haven't had one childhood death in Ireland from COVID. Now we're in this bizarre, surreal circumstance where medicine, basic medicine, is turned on its head and we're saying, oh, no, we have to vaccinate everybody um, regardless. Now, there isn't a shred of 
evidence or even common sense or science behind that. So you have to ask the question, who the hell is pushing this vaccine? I mean, you know, after Donald Trump was elected, and I'm not having a go at Donald Trump, but after Donald Trump was elected, there was a big furore about Cambridge Analytics and about how the Internet was used to kind of manipulate people's opinions in order to affect a political outcome. Well, I would be absolutely convinced with the billions and billions and billions of euros and pounds involved in pushing a vaccine, I'd be very, very surprised if there isn't some vested interest there pushing this fear factor, pushing this notion that everybody has to have a vaccine when it's absolutely rubbish when you sit back and you look at it in terms of a medical, how medicine goes about. That's not the way we do things. So reality, basic science, basic medicine, common sense, reality has all been turned on its head. And we're in this very surreal space where lots of shit is being pushed on people. And sad to say, as I said at the beginning, it's like the fucking zombie apocalypse. People are walking around completely swallowed the whole Compliant. Thing. <laughs> Compliant. C- can I ask you then, I'm not going to get too deep into this, out of respect yeah. for you, I mean, I've got an issue with safety and I do have an issue with some of the companies set up, set up by people like Bill Gates to push vaccines on people. My family doctor is a very senior lady and she is pretty aghast at how many vaccines are added to the schedule. And she would have been a big fan of the BCG vaccine and maybe she would agree with you on rotavirus, but she thinks that it's pretty worrying how we're pushing lots and lots of vaccines on children now before they're five and the companies who make them are indemnified against prosecution if anything goes wrong with them. And she worries about that. And I don't want to get you into any trouble at all, but is that something that in the future you might start paying a bit more attention to? Well, look, I think you're absolutely right. And I think you're, you're, you're probably been, you're probably been a little bit generous to me. <laughs> a little bit. Doctors, doctors should be definitely, we need to be, and this is certainly this whole COVID vaccine, you know, if this has been pushed upon people unnecessarily, then, you know, any doctor who's got a smidgen of morality really has to ask the question. Then we have to ask questions about the vaccines. Now that doesn't mean that we have to jump up and down and say the vaccines are killing everybody, yeah. but we do have to take a more, we have have to take a more educated and a more you know detailed approach to what we're doing and what's in the vaccines and i don't think that's entirely unreasonable and and the covid thing like i said at the beginning it's thrown up a lot of questions you know and certainly we do have to look at what's in vaccines but you know the reason i think we have to look in that now the reason me myself the reason i'm curious about it now is the 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 reality that there's that there's this vaccine going to be pushed on the whole population you know and that there are vested interests behind that what's happening there so you know if it's the case for that vaccine is it possibly the case for other vaccines if nursing home people weren't actually fucking looked after if they were neglected you know it, there's a lot of questions been thrown up by this COVID and certainly vaccines are certainly one of them but you know I mean in respect to vaccines you know at the end of the day you know in, in, in Ireland we've got maybe what four or five hundred people die every day on the roads you know and you know yeah. if I was to stand up tomorrow and say look let's ban the car because there's so many people I mean I think unfortunately and tragically there's a certain level of acceptance for the side effects or the deaths or the possible consequences of vaccines, you know, because of the greater good. But, you know, that's a question. That's a debate. That's a debate that needs to be had. That's, a, you know, some questions that need to be asked there, you know. But we're, we're living, as you know, from your show, we're, we're living in a society where, you know, even the very asking of questions, even asking a question about a vaccine immediately puts you into the bracket of being a lunatic, you know. Well, so that's shocking that, Marcus. That asking questions is the problem now. If I can just say this, that's the, the, and I, I, I'm going to give you the final word then, and I, and I will not um, follow up. I'll give you the final word. That's the shocking thing for me. You know, I saw there's a physicist called David Robert Grimes who was due to appear on this program a few years ago, and then he pulled out. And... I, he pulled out because he got wind of the fact I was going to have a go at him because he was calling women in Ireland child abusers because they were asking well, questions about the uh, Gardasil um, vaccine and whether it might be linked to you know, autoimmune disorders and fatigue and stuff. And those women are lovely women, those women of regret. They're decent, they're honest, they're Irish women, and they were just asking questions. And that same guy, it really struck me, what, what a coincidence, that same guy calling those women what he did was on to you 
very recently and look I'm not suggesting anything here the guy's obviously got his opinions but I, I'm like what what you said was perfectly reasonable and sound and sane why do we need to give this vaccine if it does ever get made why do we need to give it to kids and to teenagers and immediately they were in on you and, and I, I yeah. think you know there's a lot to be said about that and who you know who benefits from that and look I'm going to shut up and give you the final word I want to thank you first of all for having the cojones you know, knowing that it's going to make life uncomfortable for you to at least speak out on behalf of your patients. Because I'll tell you something, Marcus. I have given you a little bit of an easy time. And i tell you the reason I have given you a bit of an easy time. It's because I love people like you who stand up for their patients and say, no, no, listen, we're going to have to have a discussion about that. So I'm really glad you, you've done that. And I hope in the future we can talk about other medical matters in the future, next year, later this year. It doesn't have to be about vaccines. Final word to you and thanks for coming on today. Listen, th- th- thanks for that, Richie. But, uh, you know, I suppose, look, at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's about the people who have died. And it's about, you know, I, I think y- you, uh, you know, I'm, I don't want to sound like I'm preaching to you, but I think you have to be careful. And I think yeah. people have to be careful. You've been asking questions and the enemy of the people now is asking questions. And I think you have to be very careful because when you ask questions, there's an army of social media, of people out there who are trying to discredit the, quest, the pertinent questions. Now, at the minute, vaccines in general is certainly a pertinent question. But it's not the pertinent question at the moment. Because no. at the moment, we're looking at a lockdown, massive consequences of that. So, you know, try not to be distracted from, because that's what they're doing. They're trying to get people down rabbit holes where we're complaining and we're, we're pointing to the fact that, that there's something up with this vaccine. And then they're kind of coming on saying, you're trying to kill kids, you're trying to do horrible things yeah. to the world and everything else. Like, the main issues here, at least in Ireland anyway, is definitely the, the, the euthanasia of a thousand people. And the lockdown itself, this lockdown is completely and utterly ridiculous and pointless. And what they're doing is, I mean, washing your hands makes sense. Cough into your elbow makes sense. What the Swedes are doing makes sense. Look at the facts. People need to look at the facts. Look at the deaths in Sweden per over 65 and make up your own mind. Lockdown is a complete and utter waste of time. This is about controlling people about political control and the most important thing i think it's about is controlling the questions and if they can engineer you you're almost doing the other side i think a favor when you talk about kids vaccines because then you just like me you get dumped into a bucket where you're just another lunatic yeah brilliantly said marcus thanks for coming on the program today Good luck to you, and um, I'll be watching it closely. I'll be keeping an eye on you. can follow Dr. Marcus De Bruyne on Twitter. I'll tweet a link out to his Twitter. Do follow him, because he's got a lot of interesting things uh, to say, and he does tweet pretty regularly. Marcus, thanks, mate. Godspeed to you. Look after Not yourself. Not at all. Thank you, Richie, and we'll talk again sometime. You I, mind yourself. I hope we do. You too, sir. Thanks a lot. Dr. Marcus De Bruyne, live on the Richie Allen Radio Show, Monday, uh, June 15th, 2020. A lot of tweets on that. Thanks for them. As I'm... Um, Chatting away with you there, I'm trying to uh, bring in headlines. I want to get headlines in before we uh, get Dr. Paul Craig Roberts on the show. Uh, Before we do that, though, I'll tell you, before we get headlines on, uh, stay with me. Back in about 60 seconds, this is The Richie Allen Show, live from Salford in Greater Manchester. Renowned healer Mark Bayerski travels the world to find the most unique and powerful crystals for self-healing. Since the ancient times, crystals have been used as healing tools. They hold a natural healing vibration and are highly charged in positive energy. Mark teaches how to channel the universal energy and transfer it to the crystal to activate its healing power. Each crystal is used for its unique ability to target a different physical or emotional challenge. Mark Bayerski is an author, healer, speaker, and founder of the Pure Energy Healing Academy. He shares powerful messages of inspiration and healing on his daily YouTube videos, reaching millions worldwide. Mark's crystals, healing oils, and incense sticks are most sought after by other healers. His collection is available online at www.markbayerski.com. His work is presented through Lemon House, a company that creates and curates consciously made gifts. 
All right, he's in four minutes past six on Monday's programme. It is uh, the BBG, not the BBC. Let's have headlines from FSN. Back with more. Paul Craig Roberts will be with me in about five minutes' time. From Feature Story News in Washington, I'm Simon Marks. In a landmark ruling, the US Supreme Court has ruled that employers may not discriminate against employees on the basis of sexual preference or gender identity. Paul Whelan, an American businessman in Moscow, is beginning a 16-year jail sentence for espionage. The US government says it's outraged. And in Beijing, there are new fears over a fresh outbreak of COVID-19 that was traced to a food market in the city. Cheers, Simon. You can tweet at the Richie Allen Show. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. If you send a tweet there, I'll get it and I will read it. Thanks for joining in. It's nice that you join in. Hi to Graham, who says, oh, Richie, the UK may not be institutionally racist, Boris Johnson, however. Maybe, Graham. I don't know the man well enough, sadly. Maybe. I don't know the man well enough. Let's have the beach, boys, shall we? The views and opinions expressed on The Richie Allen Show are those of the guests and the guests alone. They do not necessarily reflect the position of the host or other contributors. Yes. Now, let me, let me be a bit clear in the interest of fairness. I mentioned a few minutes ago that David Robert Grimes who's an Irish physicist working in London, uh, that he pulled out of this radio show. He didn't. He didn't. I was wrong. I was wrong. I double-checked because I thought it wasn't him. It was somebody else. I'd had a running Twitter battle with this Grimes chap, and I thought that he'd agreed to come on the radio programme. He never agreed to come on. So if I gave the impression that he was, which I did, that he was due to come on but then chose not to, that's incorrect, and I apologise for that. Uh, he didn't agree to come on. It was somebody else, actually. Now that I think of it. But he's an arsehole anyway. David Robert Grimes. A nasty piece of work. You know. The people who put together Regret.ie. Concerned mothers. Lovely people. I've I've had the, the good fortune to speak to some of them. Anna Cannon being one. And, um, and others on the phone, by the way. Um, you know, plenty of off-air chats. And they came on the programme. Lovely people. Nothing in it for them. And their daughters developed dreadful illnesses or a dreadful debilitating illness after having had the totally unnecessary Gardasil vaccination. It really is. You know? And um, it's not just in Ireland. Hundreds and hundreds of girls and their families. It's all across Europe and, and in the Far East. And rather than stand up for these girls... This guy, you know, could have used his minor platform to say, well, let's have an inquiry. They deserve that at the very least. They didn't. Or he didn't. He resorted to calling them child abusers. That's where you're at, you see. That's where you're at. Now, let's get my next guest on uh, on the line. Yeah, I'm multitasking here. You know when I'm multitasking because I start sounding a bit vague. <laughs> I've got a song to line up. I've got a jingle uh, to play. I've got a line up, Paul, and I'm I'm rambling. It's called filling, but I don't have to do it now because uh, Paul is standing by. And um, Paul Craig Roberts needs very little introduction. He's a brilliant writer and journalist, and of course, economist who was once famously uh, a former. He is a former assistant secretary of the Treasury. He worked under Ronald Reagan. You can find him at paulcraigroberts.org where he writes regularly. And his articles are very thought-provoking and they're very well-researched. And I love reading him and I know you do as well. Let's welcome back to the programme our friend Paul Craig Roberts. Paul, welcome back. Thank you, Richie. What a mad world. What, what, what a place this planet has become since you and I spoke. And it's only been a couple of months since we last spoke. Before we talk about Atlanta... Before we talk about what happened in Minneapolis and all of the unreported things that you've been looking into, I've got to ask you, Paul, about the economic impact of the decision to lock down, not just lock down the United States of America and, you know, shock the economy, but also here in the UK and Europe. Do you think that anybody really understands just how grave the implications are? Well... I don't know, Richie. Um, my view is the uh, implications of the coronavirus were also grave. Uh, all the information coming out of Wuhan, it seemed like a, a horror. <clears throat> and um, 
no one knew anything about this new virus. They had no cure. They didn't know how deadly it would prove. They didn't know, they did know that it would spread very rapidly as it had in Wuhan. And so they didn't know what to do. They really didn't have any alternative because uh, the implication of having uh, huge percentages of the population uh, ill and uh, dying is uh, also horrendous for the economy. So I think the failure of the authorities was more along the line of not using the time they had from learning what was going on in uh, China uh, to when it hit them. They didn't know, they didn't use the time in order to um, um, <clears throat> get prepared. And they didn't stop the flights. They, they just, it was almost like, well, uh, we don't know what to do. We're not going to do anything. They didn't get any masks. They didn't. So on the whole, I don't know. I think that there wasn't much else they could do other than what they did do, uh, given their slowness in responding. So I'm not much worried about the economic effect of that. I think the, in the United States, the effect of the mass rioting and looting is going to have a worse effect. Um, I think, you know, businesses are going to pull out of these cities that have uh, black democratic mayors uh, that don't protect uh, property and businesses. You know, you had 500 businesses looted and burned in Minneapolis alone. You've got the whole downtown area of Seattle, Washington, uh, occupied by Antifa. Um, the business, nobody can run a business in that kind of environment. Atlanta, uh, they burned down Buckhead, the, uh, the uh, area, the high income area. And now they started again. Uh, Chicago is uh, in chaos. Um, these are all big influential cities and businesses look at this and they're certainly not going to go back into the areas that were burned down. The black areas are going to lose businesses. They're going to be unable to go to the store and do anything. Nobody's going to put a looted store back in those areas. So the economic effect of that is probably going to be horrendous. Um, the real problem with the economy is independent of COVID. It's the result of two things. One is the offshoring of the middle class jobs, which has reduced the uh, income of the population. And, and this population has had to maintain its living standards by acquiring debt. So they're now so indebted we have what really is called a debt deflation because they haven't got any money to do anything but service their debt. So th those are the real economic problems. Uh, people will try to blame uh, the virus and the close downs and that sort of thing, but that's, I don't think, what the problem is. So that's my two cents worth, Richie. Thanks for that, Paul. Paul has written a piece today that's um, entitled The Joys of Diversity and Multiculturalism Have Come Home to Roost. A typically provocative headline there from our great friend PC Orr himself. And your enemies, of course, love this because rather than read the piece and digest what it is that you've, you've written and look at the arguments you're making, they, I suppose it's easier for them to say that you're a racist or a race baiter, which isn't true, of course rather than try and deal with some of the issues that you raise. And we're going to do that this afternoon. Um, and thanks for coming back on. Paul, on the violence, I have heard on the programme in the last week or so from several prominent black Americans and one or two uh, prominent black men uh, in the UK. And my American guests have said, they've said, look, you've got to wonder about the violence. And they weren't giving a pass 
to anybody in particular or they weren't condemning anybody in particular. But they said there there seems to be quite a lot of evidence that when something happens like the, the death of George Floyd or the gentleman whom was shot in Atlanta, obviously it, it, it emotions run high and people come out to protest. But it looks like that those protests, and I know you take this on and I know you disagree with this, but it looks like that there is some infiltration of those protests by people who've got a vested interest in it blowing up into a big violent confrontation. I saw some photographs that looked very real of pallet loads of bricks, Paul, strategically placed on sidewalks in some of these places. So I'm not trying to be devil's advocate here. I'm not trying to sit on the fence, um, even though I probably should do that. It seems to me that you get some people genuinely vexed, genuinely upset at a terrible thing and it, they come out and all of a sudden it's chaos, it's looting as you described, it's cars being burned and a lot of these indigenous people, by indigenous I mean natives of Minneapolis, they're like, where the hell has this come from? What's happened here? We didn't come down here to burn the place down, we came down here to say that we're fed up of being disproportionately targeted by the police. They must have a point surely, these people. Uh, well, uh, it's well known that uh, Antifa is a, has revolutionary intent. They want to overthrow white society. Uh, um, by definition, all whites are racist. Yeah. So you're, you're a racist. I'm, everybody that's white is a racist, by definition. Uh, by definition, uh, white society you know, white civilization is racist. Even the English language is racist. That's just all by definition. So when they call you a racist, all a racist is just a synonym for being white. It's by definition, just like any critic of Israel is by definition an anti-Semite. So it doesn't mean anything to be called a racist because that's what you are by definition. All white people are racist, even the ones who say they're not. So what is, what is going on in Antifa, which now uh, has set up what they originally called uh, an autonomous zone in the uh, downtown area of Seattle. Uh, they now call it the occupied zone. Um, they uh, they have in their head the crazy idea that they're uh, going to overthrow America. So, um, what does this uh, indicate? Yes, they were very active in using this for revolutionary purposes. Uh, yes, it caught some of the innocent uh, black uh, protesters uh, off guard. Uh, but among the blacks, there are also a very large criminal element. And uh, no doubt, uh, the criminal element is happy to see the protests because that's where the police are. And then the criminal element assaults the shops that they want to loot. So you have the three things going on. You've got the people who came out to protest. You have, you have the criminal element uh, that knows we can use this to loot. And you have Antifa that's trying to uh, cause a revolution. And the bricks, sure, they are placed. They were placed in advance, uh, obviously by Antifa, uh, because they wanted the violence. So, but what you're seeing is uh, uh, a breakdown in uh, the confidence of public authorities, particularly among the Democrats. Because the Democrats simultaneously encourage the riots and the looting because they think they can use it against Trump in the November election. And, and even as they encourage it, they refuse to restore order. So, as we said, uh, 500 businesses burned down in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, uh, hundreds in Chicago, uh, Seattle is under occupation, the downtown, uh, Atlanta, Buckhead looted, burned, New York looted, burned. Uh, 
and, in the, and they're still trying to get protests going. In, and now that they've wrecked the bigger cities, they're trying to wreck the smaller ones like Chattanooga, Tennessee, Asheville, North Carolina, Portland, uh, Oregon. Um, so there is an organization here. This is not a spontaneous, a spontaneous protest that broke out in, in a dozen cities yeah. at the same time, all, all provided with bricks. Can I briefly jump in, Paul? I, I hear that. And again, we, we always have interesting conversations, you and I. We see a lot similarly. But, but I, I see this a little bit different. The, the police in Atlanta are looking for a woman who set fire to Wendy's, which my European listeners might know or might not know is a fast food restaurant, Wendy's. At least I think it is a burger, a burger joint. And I, I genuinely, and I'm no bleeding hearts liberal, I am a socialist and I make no apologies for it, um, in, in the old school sense of the word. But I see in this sense those, you know, black men and women who have genuine grievances with how they are treated by the authorities as being the real victims here. If you've got white people, maybe working for groups like Antifa, setting fire to Wendy's, I mean, what the hell is going on? Just how influential is this group Antifa? Is it mostly white liberal types who want the revolution that you described a, a moment ago? But, you know, I, again, you can call me bleeding hearts if you want. I just look at those people, those black people. Because what happened to George Floyd? Is not, it's not the first time that a black man was killed in the custody of the police when he was already immobilized. And Richie. Go ahead, Paul. Jump in, jump in, jump in. Yeah, you, you've already been brainwashed. The, the official, <laughs> I don't think I've been brainwashed. Go on. The official facts from the FBI and the Department of Justice is the police kill twice as many white people. Yes. They shoot to death twice as many white people as black people. And so but, if this is racism when they shoot a black person, what is it when they shoot the white person? There is a but, though. Blacks are disproportionately shot. Yes, you're right to say more whites are shot, but no, as a proportion of the, rep of the population, blacks are more likely to be shot. Pitchy, if when they shoot a white person, what is it? If it's racism when they shoot a black, what is it when they shoot a white? I agree with you. It's an outrage right. to me that we don't have protests when a white bloke is murdered yeah. by a... No, Absolutely. It's so silly. You're being silly. The American police are trained by the Israelis. Yeah. They have been for 20 years. What do the Israeli police do? Kneel on the neck. They persecute Palestinians. Yeah. So the Israeli police are extremely aggressive. And their techniques are extremely aggressive. But they somehow, these Israeli firms, use their political connections in Washington to get police training contracts. It is publicly known that Minnesota police were trained by Israel. So if you train your police in these techniques, you put them on a hair trigger because that's where the Israelis are. Yeah. Then the problem is police training. And everybody with a, with a brain knows that. So, but that's not what's addressed. Instead, uh, the white liberal establishment that wants to get rid of Trump and wants to get, essentially, they want to get rid of white people, as far as I can tell. Uh, they say this is murder by racism. Well, if, if whites are all racist, as we are said to be, why did we elect Obama twice as president? Why did we pass the Civil Rights Act? Why do we give black special privileges guaranteed admissions in university regardless of merit yeah uh why do they have employment quotas you have to have so many blacks whether they belong there or not so if if you're a racist what do you do all these things for so obviously it's a false charge what is the evidence well if the evidence is police brutality once again what is it when the police shoot to death a white person this is good paul this is good. Now, the difference is that when they shoot to death a black person, the national media makes an issue of it and keeps it alive for days, sometimes for weeks. 
if they shoot to death a white person, it never gets beyond the local media. Agreed, but that's not the fault or the or the problem of the black man or woman. There's so much I agree with here. Thanks for educating my listeners as to police training and Israel. You're bang on. I've done the research. I've read your articles. You are spot on. This is important. You're right. They don't spend any time talking about an act of aggression. <laughs> what what you know, about against all white the people. business owners... Yeah. who burn out. They didn't have anything to do with this. No. What, what, you know, when you have a, look at all the, the Korean and Chinese businesses yeah. that were burnt out. They're people of color. What, so let's, let's just don't worry about the gullible blacks who went out there and got used. Let's look at also what all the people who are wiped out. And the real problem for the, for the innocent blacks is going to be the stores aren't going to go back. Which is going to be problematic economically for those towns. That's exactly right. Which so, you said earlier on. Yeah, yeah, so let's come point. back to it. Who's responsible? It was the Democratic mayors who wouldn't control the riots. What, what 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 happens when the Democratic mayor in Seattle says um, uh, to the police, abandon your precinct? And then people come in and they take over um, an area. It's outrageous. So, so what you want to do is say, well, how, a come, police public to be abandoned, authorities, yeah. how come public authorities didn't? prevent the rioting and looting. Well, well, maybe those same authorities have some sort of vested interest in the rioting and looting taking place, maybe. Because what, what, what you described earlier on about white people being called racist and how the term has become trivial as much as calling somebody who's anti-Israel, anti semitic that was a brilliant point you made. But I know through the media and through interviewing people and producing programs and living in the UK I've met a lot of black people over the years and black people don't scream racism Paul I don't meet black people who have the opinion that I'm a racist just because I'm white I think we're getting played here all of us and I think it's very sophisticated sometimes you know, I'm not saying that some black people haven't been idiots and haven't looted. I'd be an idiot myself if I said that. You're right, but there's something deeper going on here, I think. I, 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 I don't know what it is, but I believe it's more sinister. You know, there's nothing in it for these people who um, come out with their candles and their placards and they, they're genuinely upset about police brutality. And before they know it, their city is in flames and they're saying, well, we didn't do this. That's a white woman who threw a petrol bomb into Wendy's. What's going on? And, you know, to be fair to you, your articles are always very nuanced and, you know, you open a lot of doors. But I think we're getting whole benefits from this chaos, Paul. This, this, these crazy times that you've just described very well. Towns emptied out, businesses not returning to towns, mobs ruling, taking over police stations. I've already told whole you. Benefits. I've already told you. Antifa thinks that they're fomenting a revolution. Uh, the, some some yeah. of the progressives think they're, uh, they're fomenting uh, change from below. Uh, uh, you know, criminal elements uh, see this is useful for looting and stealing things. Uh, Democrats think that somehow they can turn this against Trump. You know, they tried to turn Russia Gate, impeach Gate. They try to blame Trump for COVID. Now they think they can blame him for this. Yes, all these people have um, have elements in it. But what I'm concerned about is not the poor black guy. I'm concerned about America. Yeah. Because what we're watching is social collapse. We're watching, uh, you see, a, a diverse, multicultural society cannot be based on hatred. But what have the white liberals done for decades? They've taught blacks to hate white people because everything that the black experiences that isn't wonderful is the fault of white supremacy. 
We have the New York Times now has a project called the 1619 Project, and they're rewriting American history that the United States is based 100% on white racism. Well, this is not true, but they are creating a false history. The false history creates in the blacks a sense of great wrongdoing and oppression and injustice, and they have created all kinds of hatred of white people. If you look at my, one of my recent postings is a video of Hillary Clinton speaking to blacks, encouraging their hatred in every way she can. And as she speaks, there are videos of blacks just beating the living hell out of white kids. Just one after the other, after the other, after the other. And that is the expression of the hatred they've been taught for decades. Let me read a dissenting opinion. Say that they don't hate white people. I don't believe they do, Paul. And I'm not just trying to be the devil's advocate here. They've been taught that. That's that's all they've been taught. Haven't we? Haven't we as white? But let me read a quick tweet from Patricia. She's Irish-American, living in Switzerland these days. And she says the, the chaotic situation we see now wouldn't have gotten so far out of hand if the Republican president of the United States encouraged unity and not division. Before you answer that, I've got to say this very quickly and then you come back in. By the way, folks, paulcraigroberts.org. Uh, Paul's a great writer. Um, I'm not patronising Paul when I say that. He's a fantastic writer and he's a great broadcaster. Go to paulcraigroberts.org and there are links there to his books as well. Articles are unmissable. I read them every single day of the week. Check out his latest article on this very subject. But haven't we, historically, and by we, I mean white people, Western white people, and don't say no, um, uh, Mr. PCR, because I know you know this to be true. We've been taught to dislike, we've been taught, forget about Hillary Clinton for a minute, to be suspicious of the black man or the brown-skinned man. Ultimately, aren't we all being played off against one another by a ruling elite that laughs and rubs its hands while we kill one another in the manner you described? What do you think? Well, uh, the whole function of identity politics yeah. is to split the population into mutually warring factions so no one can control the government or the elite. So identity politics teaches women that men oppress women. It teaches uh, the gay, the homosexuals, that straights oppress them. It teaches uh, people of color that whites oppress them. And so you have uh, a population that is against one another. And that is what identity politics does. It prevents any unity. So in that sense, yes, whoever came up with identity politics. It's now the official political ideology of the Democratic Party. So it's now institutionalized in American politics. It is the um, ideology of the New York Times. They have the uh, 1619 Project based on it. It's now probably the official history teaching in the universities. I'm sure in black studies, in women's studies. What do you think women's studies does? It, it, it gives the uh, picture of uh, the male as abusive of women. What do you think black studies does? It tells, oh, everything that's wrong is because of white racism. You can't just have this year after year, decade after decade, and not have a population that lives in a false consciousness created by a false history. I grew up in the South. There was no hatred between whites and blacks. Whites relied on blacks to help them raise their children, to cook their food, to run their household. You don't give people you hate those kinds of responsibilities. But you just described subservience, though. See, blacks would say, well, there you are, Paul. That's Oh, bullshit. Well, that's what they would say. 
<laughs> hey, so you're subservient to everyone, everybody who employs you then, okay? Don't shout at me, my old friend. I'm just saying what they would say in this situation. I love you, by the way. You know that. It's just nonsense, Richie. Listen, that's what they would say. It's my job to do that, isn't it? To say what they would say. And by the way, that's my great friend. We're trying to get to the point. To the point of it, right. Have more propaganda. Yeah. I'm not spreading propaganda. Listen, a black person listening to this program might say, what a rosy picture of the South painted by Paul Craig Roberts. They hung black people for being black in the South. I they mean, unspeakable, unspeakable things were done to black people in the South, Paul. No, no. You don't believe that? Despite no. all the evidence we have of black men being lynched and oh, white mobs, no, the KKK. And, you, you're talking about things in the, during Reconstruction after the Civil War. When, yeah. Yeah. You know, 1870. Yeah. Listen, I'm not trying to be pedantic. You know I'm not. I'm putting the other side of it. Black people would say, come on, Paul. Unspeakable things were done to my great-grandparents. We can't just ignore that. That's what they would say. Richie, more unspeakable things have been done to everybody. The British to the Irish to yeah. the Scottish. You know, it's endless. Uh, just in my lifetime, we had the blacks massacring each other. I think it was that the, uh, the, the Hutu uh, massacred a million Tutsi. Uh, the black slave trade originated in black Africa by the king of Dahomey, his slave wars. He warred against other blacks. He, that's where they got slaves. They sold them to the Arabs. Later, some of them were sold to the colonists. Uh, in America, it was an inherited institution. It was here for 200 years before there was a United States. Uh, nobody did this because they hated blacks. The first slaves were whites. The first slaves in America were whites. There was no labor force. It was huge land and resources. This is not anything to do with racism. As, as I said, the slaves came from the black king of the homie. Now, when you teach everybody, oh, you've been so abused and blah, blah, and they hate you, and blah, then that's what they think. And so you end up with a country, diverse, multicultural, and there's no unity, and that's what I'm talking about. I'm in favor of unity. I've been pointing out for decades, look, you cannot have a multicultural, diverse population that's at each other's throats. And so what do we gain by teaching all of this and teaching all this? Why don't we say, look, uh, everyone has a rough time in life. Uh, the, the British uh, used to kidnap kids in yeah. London and send them over here as slaves. They sent the Irish they, who, who had the wrong religion. They were Catholics. So Carmel sends the Irish over here as slaves. The, they send the Scots over here as slaves. They, um, what has this got to do? No, it's very racism? good. It's, it, What's it got to do with racism? You're contextualizing it, which is very good. And I'm, again, I'm not patronizing it. It's important. We have the discussion. I've got to be the guy putting the other side of it because the other side isn't here. That's what I'm bloody well doing. The uh, other side is in the news. Not all of it, though. You know, look, you know full well, you've got a lot of readers who um, would be African-American readers or black readers. We speak to black men and women who don't agree with the Hillary Clinton argument. They don't agree with the Tony Blair argument. Yeah, well, they uh, may argument. not agree, but it's the dominant argument. So where are they? Yeah. Okay. So we're talking, we're talking about what, what's going on. And so there's a dominant argument. And the dominant argument is that white people are all white supremacists. Uh, they think they're superior to everybody else. And so they turn them into slaves and they abuse them and they kill them and they hang them and they lynch them and, and so on and so on. And so if you, you raise kids with that kind of notion in their heads and they say, oh, well, the reason I'm not rich is the whites have held me down. I don't and want that, to believe. The reason right? I don't have a 55-inch TV is because the whites won't let me have one. And that's what they think. And so, yeah, I have a right to go in the store and take it because the whites have withheld it from me. But you can't. But, Paul, it's, 
it's a very unfair generalisation to, to to suggest. I think. Hear me out now for twenty seconds. It's an unfair generalisation to think that blacks think as one no more than they speak as one. The vast majority of black people are horrified to see anybody oh. coming out of a supermarket with a stolen television. A black person listening to this might say, ah, come on, Paul, you, you, that's a lazy stereotype. We don't like that any more than you do. stores, Richie? Say again? Who looted the stores? Who set the we're store on fire with, in Atlanta? It was, a, it was a white woman. Current events. We're yeah. talking about current events, what's happened. Who looted the stores? The black people. And the white people. No. The black people looted the stores. So what about the white woman who set fire to Wendy's in Atlanta yesterday? Well, I don't know if the white woman set fire to Wendy's or not. Uh, I don't know who set fire to it. If she did, then she's part of the Antifa. Yeah. Or she's one of these self-hating whites that she also believes that whites are racist and have oppressed the blacks. And uh, Look, uh, uh, what's his name? George Floyd. Um uh, as a, as a five-time felon. He has a criminal record. Yeah, but well, come on, Paul. Uh, he was passing uh, counterfeit bills. Somebody called the police. They came. He was high on uh, these drugs that do cause heart attacks. Uh, so we don't know if the knee on the neck killed him or whether the stuff he had in his body, you know, the tax, toxicology reports show he was high on these drug things that that will give you heart attacks. So we don't know, but the, the, I, I am, I have been for years, uh, a leading critic of police tactics. Yeah. Police yeah, yeah. We've talked about it and, yeah. and, and nobody has done anything about it. And what we can hope now is that finally something will be done and they'll stop letting the Israelis train the police and the police will be trained um, like they were when I was a kid. Helpful, reasonable. Uh, maybe we can get back to that. That may be the good thing that can come out of, uh, of uh, George Floyd's death. But to, to say that this the guy resisting arrest and so on is uh, murdered by, by racism is not true. We don't it's know not. it's true. I, I, I agree with you. I, I think you make a good point there. When George Floyd was killed and the police were initially fired, I, I um, like you, was reluctant to accept that the officer, Derek Chauvin, was racist. Nobody could know that. I believe... You're right that the horrible tactics... I mean, you talked about the police many, many years ago. The police used to be trained to de-escalate situations yeah. when a gentleman was, was, was um, vexed, when a gentleman was, you know, was very highly strong. They had tactics to defuse that. Now they go straight for the mace or for the taser or for the gun. I make you, One of our listeners is tweeting, Paul, are you really saying that there were no white people who looted? There are videos that show they were... I'm 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 ashamed. I'm I'm embarrassed that Paul is saying this. I used to respect Paul and it makes me sad. Well hang on a second, Paul might not have seen those videos, but I've seen them as well, Paul. I've seen videos of white people running out of shops. I have, honestly, I've seen those videos. I'm not just saying that now to try and piss you off, but I have seen it. I, I, I can't in good conscience say it's just black people running out of this of the stores with fifty five inch TVs. We've seen some white guys do it as well, you know. Well, what what percentage? I couldn't. I have no idea. One percent. Um, were they Antifa? Uh, you know, it'd be very dangerous for a white person to be out in that rioting. They'd probably be beat up. Uh, so, unless it's Antifa, because they are very aggressive and mutually protective, um, it's very difficult to see that. Paul, Antifa is just a tool, isn't it? Antifa is a tool. What's really behind it? I don't want to get into conspiracies now. Um, I've got, we've known each other too Richie, long. Look, What's behind it? Suppose, suppose it's white people. What does it mean? Yeah. Oh, no, I'm not trying to make that point at all. It doesn't matter to me if they're white people or Chinese or Hispanics. I couldn't care less. What, who is using Antifa to achieve what? Because I don't, know. I don't either. I don't, and I want to know. I want to know I who's behind know, it. I don't know who's financing it. We yeah. don't know. The FBI 
uh, it has been studying uh, white supremacy for decades. They can't find any, so they have to create the organizations themselves. But they don't study Antifa. Antifa seems to have a past. Um, I don't know anything about it because uh, you can't find out anything. Uh, there's There was some just the other day, right, a few blocks from my house standing out with signs uh, in white supremacy. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, blah blah blah. I mean, uh, and they and they and they were all white except there's only one black. Now, in a recent case in Atlanta, uh, not the cops that shot the guy resisting arrest uh, in front of Wendy's, um, but there was some other incident of uh, the police pulling a black couple out of a car. I don't know whether the car tried to run them down or whether they didn't do anything at all. But six Atlanta policemen were suspended and under investigation. The pictures are uh, online. Of the six, five of them are black. Yeah. So is this racism? Uh, five, six of the force that pulls two blacks out of a car, and this is racism, but the cops are five blacks and one white. Well, you know, what I think is going to happen is the police are just going to stop trying. They're going to stand down. And when they stand down, then there's going to be more looting, more riot, more burning. And... Um, and it's going to be more convincing that racism is rampant and the Democrats are going to get burned by this. I agree with you, by the, the way, whites, Paul. The whites will finally get radicalized. Uh, and all the things that they've said about white people, they'll start responding that way. They'll say, we've had enough. We're tired of being called names. We're tired of having to listen to this crap. We're tired of not feeling safe when we go out. Uh, we're tired of the stores burning down. We're, we're tired of the threats to our neighborhoods. We're just tired of it. And then you're going to see uh, more radicalization, but yeah. this time from the white people. And then you're going to start seeing a lot more violence. And then, you know, as Father Saker says, America is in the final state of collapse. And I have commented on that. I think he's right. I think we're in the final state of collapse. We are, the United States is a tower of Babel. There's no unity. All the white liberals have done the entirety of my life is to encourage hate. All the whites did this to you. They did this. Yeah. They did this. They did this. They did that. They did this. Blah, blah, blah. Well, They've got it now. They've got the hate. And now it's going to radicalize white people. And they're going to say, well, I'm just tired of this. We've got four minutes left. I'm going to give you my final two pence worth on this, or two cents, as you'd say. And then you'll get the final word. You can have two or three minutes if you want. Uh, love having you on. Love that we can have a robust chat about this. Uh, sadly, you don't get this in the mainstream media anymore. Uh, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, amazing writer, great guy. PaulCraigRoberts.org. Read his articles. His articles will trigger you. That's his job. It's the job of any great writer to fire up your imagination and get you thinking about things maybe that you're uncomfortable thinking about. Here's my two cents, Paul. I'll shut up and you'll have the final two or three minutes. Um, Listen, I don't believe that the United States is institutionally racist. Of course it's not. I agree with you. I don't believe that the UK or my country, Ireland, is institutionally racist. It isn't. I think fundamentally people are decent. I, I agree with everything you've described. I think a, a war that will go from a culture war into a full-scale war, I think, is on the way. I think you've um, summed that up brilliantly. But I think where we might deviate, and you will get the final word, where we deviate is, I think it's engineered. I think somebody wants it to happen. And I believe that ultimately, nobody wins, whether you're white, black, you know, from Latin America, whatever. Ultimately, we're all slaves to some sort of agenda. And that's where I am. It's been engineered to be like this. And we're all just pawns. And I, I believe that in my bones. Final word to you, uh, Paul, and thanks again for coming back on. We love you here. Go ahead. Final word to you. Well, 
Richie, I don't really disagree with that. I just don't know who's engineering it. I have said many, many, many times that it serves the establishment and it serves the government because the people are too split to unite against it. How, so you can't control the government or the establishment when you can't unite. And so clearly it serves the ruling establishment. Clearly it serves the permanent government because the people are so disunited, they cannot unite against the government or against the establishment. So yes, that's going on. That's no doubt. I don't disagree with you at all. How, and, and I think also, and many people have made this, that, the, that this has a relationship to cultural Marxism, and that cultural Marxism was a device that some of the paranoid uh, Jewish intellectuals came up with in order to split up uh, white society so it wouldn't be a threat again to the Jews. So there's also that element. I've not ever studied that, but I'm aware that there are people who do, and yeah. they claim that this is an element. So there can be all kinds of agendas served by, by this, and, and you're right. I don't disagree with that. I just don't, you know, it's just very hard to nail down who, who it is. That's why I say somebody should be looking to see who's financing Antifa, where they get the money. You know, it's not easy to have huge uh, loads of bricks are delivered to a dozen cities. Costs money. You know, it's not, you, you got to be able to transport people. You got to have them in Chicago and Atlanta and all these different places. And there's got to be money involved. So if, why, why isn't there an investigation? Why doesn't the media say, hey, where is this, where, where is this coming from? Where's the support? Where's the money? What's financing? And they don't say a word about it. So no. we're not going to find out. They're going to go on and on. They're trying to br blame the violence. They're trying to say that it wasn't Antifa, it's white supremacists. Well, who are these white supremacists? Where are their organizations? Where are their magazines? Where are their newspapers? And where are their representatives in government or the media? They're, you know, it's kind, of like a, it's kind of like a unicorn. I've never seen a white supremacist. I don't know who they are. Yeah, there's no doubt there's a lot of prejudiced people. But, you know, the notion that there's some kind of a white supremacist force out there, I don't know where it is. I'm, so, so yeah, it's just all, uh, why, why don't we know who's financing Antifa? Why does the FBI waste years and years on white supremacist organizations? It has to actually go and create them itself. If, if people, if white supremacy was there, why they vote for Obama? I've already asked you these questions. Yeah, yeah, that's a good if question. If white supremacy, why aren't they out there with the AK-47 shooting these riders down in the streets? They could very easily do it. Antifa's causing violence. They can, you can reply to violence with violence. Where are these white supremacists? Where are they? Where, you know, I don't see them. Where are their armbands and stuff? And, you know, these are I questions hope. that I suppose we'll we'll come back to time and again in the future. I will say this: I, I know, like you've had the last word, and I said I wouldn't say anything, but because you mentioned finance, there is a black radio host out of New York called Larry Gators, and he's a really interesting guy, very good radio presenter. He's been on with me, and he believes that he has evidence tying Antifa to people like George Soros. Now, I haven't seen any incontrovertible evidence, but, you know, he's thrown his name out there and, you know, that, that Soros has been a financier of many of these um, groups, not just in the US, but elsewhere. But I haven't seen it. And of course, when you mention Soros, others will say, well, that's just an anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist. I don't know, but these are serious yeah, questions. That's what they'll say. That's what they'll say, won't they? Listen, um, you know we love you on the programme. Um, that's, um, that's not a throwaway line. Love having you on. You should come back more often. Paul's website is paulcraigroberts.org. Um, brilliant economist. Uh, served under Ronald Reagan, of course. US Assistant Treasury Secretary. Uh, and an author. And his books are great. Provocative articles sometimes. Um, but that's no bad thing either. You know I love you, Paul. Thanks for coming back today. And I can't wait till we speak again in the very near future.
I always enjoy it, uh, Rich, even when I lose my patience. No harm in you losing. Listen, listen. <laughs> No harm when you lose. A lot of people lose patience with me, Paul. I've got thick skin. I don't mind. I've got well, to be. We, we, we nevertheless love you. Yeah, cheers, mate. Love having you on. Thanks, Paul. Paul Craig Roberts, live from uh, his home in Virginia today. You probably heard a cat screaming in the background there. He's got a couple of cats, Paul. He's a cat lover, you see, if you needed any other reason. <laughs> right, that's it for today. Thanks to Paul. Thanks as well to Dr. Marcus De Bruyne who joined me in Air One. Fascinating conversation with him. Uh, the programme will be on the usual platforms, Podomatic, uh, Spotify, iTunes, and I will put it on YouTube. But I'm not going to be putting it on YouTube for much longer. I've given you a warning about that already. And I don't care if you don't like that. I really couldn't give a shit, to be honest. I have no time for Google or YouTube. And it's a waste of my time putting it on YouTube. For people who really don't have any gratitude that I do that. And when they complain about the fact that I don't put it on YouTube... I go and look to see if they ever made a financial contribution to the programme. And they haven't. So double feck off. Right? Okay. There's nothing in it for me. I can't monetize it on there. They block the like lists and they block people from commenting on it and all the rest of it. So what's the bloody point? It's on iTunes. It's on Spotify. It's on Podomatic. So very soon it won't be on YouTube any longer. Right? You with me? Bye now.